Hey, deserving listeners, I thought I would answer some patron emails. If you're a patron, your emails get preference if you email me your questions. So let's answer some emails here. I've been getting some questions about dissociative identity disorder. I have a, I had a rerun where that was from eight years ago. Uh, we, so we, we posted a rerun episode from eight years ago in which I said that I wasn't quite sure about dissociative identity disorder or it used to be called multiple personality disorder. In, in that episode from eight years ago, I said something along the lines of, you know, there's a controversy about whether or not it really exists or not. And I want to be clear in the intervening years of uh, training and more investigation eight years and probably, I don't know, six years ago or something, I set out to answer the question for myself as a clinician, is dissociative identity dis disorder a thing? Is multiple personality disorder a thing? Because I had heard that some people make it up and it's just this fake diagnosis, doesn't really exist. And I consulted with experts. I actually started treating clients with dissociation and dissociative identity disorder, looking into the research, the forensic uh, evidence. And I'm here to tell you, it is 100% a thing. It didn't take me long to realize. Once you actually talk to people with dissociative identity disorder, you realize, oh yeah, this is a thing. Now, can some people fake it? Absolutely. People fake all sorts of things all the time. But the vast majority of people who claim they have dissociative identity disorder do indeed have the disorder. To uh, I, I, we've we've made episodes where we go into depth on it, but just in brief, when we are when we are young, age two, three, four years old, and we are going through something that is very scary, something very traumatic, something very difficult for us, it apparently is a human coping mechanism that is available to us to develop at that age, in which we dissociate, meaning we separate our minds from reality from the outside world, from our awareness of what's happening, so that we can protect ourselves from what's happening. Think of it like you're in a room and your parents are fighting and you're four years old and you just decide, well, you're whatever age, you're, you're, you're 40 years old and uh, two of your friends start to fight and you don't like it. it. It upsets you that they're fighting. And one of the things available to you is just to stand up and walk out of the room and say, okay, I think I'm going to leave now. I'll go to the bathroom. I'll go outside. I'll, I'll go home or whatever it is. You, it's a, it's a thing to do, right? It's like, I don't, I don't want to deal with this right now. This is really difficult. Well, when you're two years old, three years old, and you're being sexually abused, physically abused, by the way, trigger alert for, I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to be talking about dissociation for some people. So for some people, this uh, this might be triggering, and so don't listen to this if if you think you're going to be triggered in a negative way. So you're two, three years old. You're being abused in some terrible way. You're being sexually abused. You're being physically abused, and you're scared, and you're you feel completely helpless. You feel completely unable to protect yourself. There's no way out. Well to human beings at that age, there's this mechanism to help us cope, which is to dissociate, meaning we, we go into the backs of our minds. We separate our awareness from what's happening. Our brain goes into a mode in which only some of the outside world, only some of even what's happening to our body is being encoded into memory and is being felt by the person and their personality. And so this results in a variety of different dissociative disorders that we see in adult, or in you know, later childhood teenage, uh, uh, teenagers and adults, um, one of which is called dissociative identity disorder. And for this disorder, the early person, the early child, developed different alters, we call them. We used to call them different personalities. Now they call them different alters because the idea is, is that the person has one personality, but different alters within that personality. It's a bit of a semantic thing. Don't worry about it. But the point is, is that there are different people inside of the person. So think of it like that when the person is being abused, a person, a mode, if you will, of the person steps forward to experience the abuse such that the other alters, the other personalities, 
within the person don't have to experience the abuse. This is a simplistic way of looking at it, but you know, this is one possible scenario. So that another altar can, so the other altars don't have to experience the abuse. And then other altars, and because this split starts to happen where there's differing altars that are, are arise due to the difficulty with the trauma, the self or the mind develops kind of an itchy trigger finger on developing altars for all sorts of things. So it'll start, it'll develop an altar for when you go to the doctor or an altar when you go to school or an altar when you want to play with uh, other boys at on this playground or an altar on how to speak in front of crowds or an altar on how to hold on to your childhood innocence. And one can develop uh, 15, 30 different altars, all of which have different experiences, some of which communicate with each other, some of which don't. Uh, and it's, 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 it's it depicted in movies. My cat wants to chime in. The, it's depicted in movies in a way that is not usually very responsible. You know, the movie Split, we did a whole episode on that in which... They, in that movie, it's by M. Night Shyamalan, they depict dissociative identity disorder pretty well until they, of course, change it into this nefarious thing where one of the altars is basically a monster that wants to kill people. <laughs> and some altars are actually criminal and abduct people and this kind of thing. And it, 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 it's this thing in Hollywood where they... Uh, well, what I'll say is, is that in our society, we barely talk about these things. And the one and only time we end up talking about these things is in fantastical movies, because that's what movie writers do. They like to take things in life. It inspires them to write a story around that. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to blame them, not Shyamalan for writing a terrible um, or, you know, writing a, a story that d stigmatizes uh, mental disorders, what I will blame is society not talking about dissociative identity disorder enough such such that when people watch that movie, they go, oh, well, that's a fantastical version of that. Um, so I hope you get my point. Anyway, uh, yeah, so dissociative identity disorders thing, we've done whole episodes on it. I, I've interviewed people on this podcast. If you're new to the podcast, go back and listen to those um, episodes, over, you know, since 2016-ish or something. We've, we've been doing various episodes on dissociative identity disorder. I know some of you want me to talk about other dissociative disorders, and I am uh, going to be making some episodes about that. The key with that is that I, I want to gather descriptions from people because it's a very specific experience that is hard to explain without having actual experience. So if you suffer from a dissociative disorder, feel free, feel free to email me. Uh, by going to the contact on, uh, page on psychologyandstyle.com and let me know if you want me to share it on the air because that might help me to develop that episode. All right, so let's move on to another email. Oh, but before moving forward, I just want to say that there is no controversy in my field as to whether or not it exists or not. The only quote unquote controversy is that many clinicians are not experts in it and are walking around with this false notion based on, I don't know what, the internet or a bad professor or something, that dissociative identity disorder doesn't exist. There, there's no debate within the field of trauma and dissociation that dissociative identity disorder exists or not. Um, it's quite clear when you talk with the people who suffer from this, or, from this disorder that it is the way it's described, that they are different alters or different personalities that may or may not communicate with others. People suffering from the disorder will, uh, they'll, they'll wake up all, all of a sudden and they'll, they'll have not have any memory of the past four hours or the past week. And it'll be very distressing to them. Imagine how distressing that would be to have. And then people get very uh, depressed because of the disorder. It's not a fun experience for a lot of people. For some people, it's, it can be managed and uh, managed well, and many people do manage it well. Um, and that's usually the treatment of it. It's not usually trying to get rid of it. It's hard to do, um, if, if at all possible. It's usually a management. It's usually getting the alters to talk with each other, getting them to work with each other, having some harmony between them. 
uh, obviously recovering from the traumas that resulted in the dissociation in the first place, but that doesn't take away the dissociative identity disorder usually. Um, so, so there's no debate. Uh, understand that that it's it's very clear. And eight years ago on the podcast, when I said that there was, I was one of those ignorant clinicians who didn't know what he was talking about, saying that there was a debate when there is there isn't one. <laughs> well, only among those people who have never treated people. Uh, and to the question as to whether or not someone would fake it or not, people with dissociative identity disorder. Uh, everyone that I've worked with and everyone I've heard about, they never are, there's no gain to having the disorder. There's no gain for them to act like they have the disorder. Uh, they would be the first people that would say, my God, if I could have anything in this world, I wish I didn't have this. Well, depending on how um, th their experience of it is, but it's often extremely difficult for them. Like I said, imagine waking up, all of a sudden you're driving your car and you don't know how you got in your car and you don't know what happened. You don't know what day it is. You don't know what triggered you to dis to dissociate and jump to a different altar. You don't know what you said. You don't know what happened. It's like Memento, the movie, the, the Christopher Nolan movie. You're just like, wait, what's going on right now? That's a very distressing uh, experience. Once you go to enough therapy and you get to know it well enough, you can manage it and you can be like, well, okay, I must have something must have triggered me to go to a different altar and you start sort of piecing it together and you have a management system. You talk to people around you. What happened? What happened? Okay. I, I can see where that happened. And yeah, you know, there's a way to manage it for sure, but it's, um, it's not a fun time and people who experience it have often when they come into therapy, they will complain about a lot of depression, a lot, maybe even suicidality and uh, so this notion that people with dissociative identity disorder are just faking it is laughable when you actually meet the people. Anyway, all right, let's move on to another email. All right, this next email is from someone who wants to be referred to as Cam Model in Seattle. So a camera model, a, a sex worker, Cam Model, someone who uh, does cam modeling, <laughs> someone who takes their clothes off in front of a webcam and gets paid for it, I believe. Uh, and she writes, I am a cam model and by watching a few of your videos, I am still unclear what your view on sex workers is. I feel it takes a very certain personality to do this job, but it gives me a lot of fulfillment. So uh, yeah, my, my view on sex workers is it's fine. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second, but just to some, I asked her for, you know, to tell her story and, she, and to summarize what she emailed me. She says that she's in therapy right now and, and she has a good therapist who doesn't judge her for her career, but she's had a lot of bad therapists in the past who judge her for her career, which is really unfortunate. I have had uh, a lot of colleagues in the field of therapy who have done sex work, and uh, it's, it's starting to change ever so slowly. And I think Seattle has a bit more of an open mind than other places in the United States anyway. But anyway, uh, she goes on to say her background, that her parents were alcoholic and that she was her dad's favorite. He didn't, he didn't physically abuse her, but he did physically abuse other people in the family. And so she became his entertainer. And she also wanted to be clear that she was never sexually abused. So th th there's a, two things to bring up here in terms of what she was emailing me. One is, is this assumption that all people who work in sex work have been sexually abused and, uh, uh, you know, otherwise, why else would they do those things? Uh, that's silly. Uh, that, that's, that's, uh, can sexual abuse result? So th the other thing I'll say here is that <laughs> Sexual abuse is a horrible, horrible thing that is currently happening to people as we speak, which is awful to think about. It's something that I had to reckon with early in my career, being front you know, lines with people who are just coming out of the closet as someone who's, who's being currently sexually abused. Teenagers, kids, adults coming to me and saying, I am being sexually abused I'm in the midst of a sexually abusive relationship and to be at the front lines of that and to know that the system can only do so much and that society is still backward in a lot of ways. And you just know that right now there are people being sexually abused 
and no one knows around them. And it's, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. Anyway, uh, so I just want to be clear on that. And can sexual abuse trauma result in people choosing a career in sex work? Sure, that, that could be a factor. But does that mean it's pathological? Does that mean that we would pathologize that, that choice? Uh, similarly, someone might be sexually abused early in life and they grow up to have a kink uh, in sex that involves being tied up. Let's say that they were tied up in there uh, as a child, which was rape and uh, obviously n not uh, consented to and traumatic and horrific. And that individual grows up and goes through therapy, has some trauma treatment, and after recovering for the most part, has a uh, retention of the of this kink that seems highly related to the sexual abuse they went through, in which they like to be tied up during sex. And you think, well, you know, something's wrong with that. No, just because something has its roots in something horrible doesn't mean that it's terrible. We live in a sex negative culture, which means that pretty much everything related to sex is judged and considered gross and considered sinful and wrong, particularly for women. And we need to question that. It's a silly notion. Sex is sex. Sex is good. Sex, sex can be bad. <laughs> sex can be used for evil. But for the most part, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And kinks and fetishes and you know, all sorts of things are, should be celebrated in the same way that some people like to go fishing and some people like to go for a hike and some people like to read uh, mystery novels and some people like to listen to podcasts and some people like to watch uh, YouTube videos of other people playing video games. These are all wonderful things in life that are things that people like to do and uh, sex is, is no different than that. Can sex result in bad things? Yes. Can YouTube result in bad things? Can hiking result in bad things? Yes. Can drinking a glass of wine be a wonderful thing? Yes. Could it be a terrible thing? Yes. So we, we don't just look at a behavior and automatically assume that it's pathological and terrible. So, so she's, she wanted to be, you know, she wanted to be clear to the listeners because she wanted me to share this with the, with the listeners that she was not sexually abused and that, uh, you know, it, that's, that's don't always assume that people who work in sex work were sexually abused. Um, the other thing that she points out here is that her parents were alcoholic and that her dad was physically abusive to everyone in the family except for her and that she was the entertainer for her father. So this presents a, a role in the family that her, she was elected to and she volunteered for subconsciously that balanced the system out. Listen to all my episodes on family systems theory to, to learn more. But the, uh, the premise is that in a family system, everyone, was, uh, everyone has to take a role. And when there are, uh, when there's significant dysfunction and anxiety and tension, then people really need to develop roles and stick with them because otherwise the family uh, stability will fall apart very quickly. And so th this is a frequent thing. When you have a tyrant in a family, often there will be one person that will be elected to be the, the favorite of the tyrant. The tyrant will not abuse that person as much. And that person, and it's usually a child and it's often a, a daughter in my anecdotal experience who is elected to be a companion for the tyrant to be comforting to be there to love the tyrant because the tyrant needs love too and this balances out the system because the tyrant gets some pleasure gets some attachment needs met but of course the relationship is asymmetrical meaning the child doesn't have power and the child's the child's uh, childhood is skipped over because they're spending a lot of time taking care of their of their parents and one of the skills that can be developed during this time is the ability to really read other people's emotions and be able to quote unquote manipulate them meaning that you really notice other people's emotional state and you really really notice how you learn very quickly, even after just interacting with someone for a couple of minutes, you learn very quickly what makes them tick. 
And this can be used for evil, it can be used for good, it could be used for a lot of different things. But this is a, a very common syndrome that some of you listeners probably know that you have, or you know someone that does have this, where when they meet someone, they, they're very focused on the emotional state of the other person. They're very good at picking up the emotional state. Sometimes on the internet, people will call these people empaths. And uh, I don't, the, the term empath is not a clinical term, so it's not strictly defined, but I'm guessing that some of the people are uh, people who with this syndrome, where they were raised in a way that they had to become very attuned to their parents' emotional state. And so they're very skilled at it and they're very skilled at uh, um, also managing the other person's emotions. And they have tremendous anxiety when they can't manage other people's emotions. So they're very outward focused because as a child, their safety depended on their ability to notice and um, affect the emotional state of the tyrant. And that might lend itself to being a sex worker because, or any job that involves working with other people and, and making them feel better, being a massage therapist, being a therapist for that matter, uh, and being a sex worker. All these jobs involve noticing other people's emotions and being able to help them and, and getting a certain pleasure from being able to help people in the way that it, it appears that she did early in life. She goes on to, in her email, say that she realized when she was very young that she was attractive and she realized she didn't have to work as hard as other people because of her looks. She realized that when men or boys were attracted to her, that they treated her very differently. And she learned also how in this, in this social situations, how to please men. She, she learned, oh, they're going to pay attention to me. And if I'm going to get my needs met, I have to figure out how to make them happy so that I can get my needs met. And that was another skill that she learned. Again, we don't have to pathologize it. It's just an experience. She was, uh, she, according to her, an attractive girl, attractive teenage girl, and learned how to um, read people <laughs> and how to affect them. Can a cam model from Seattle, uh, can she use this for evil? Sure. Uh, can she use it for good? Absolutely. There, we don't have to pathologize it. She goes on to say that she had a lot of disappointing jobs. And in these jobs, there was drama sometimes because men would be attracted to her and women would treat her badly on the job. And then on a whim, she decided to try cam modeling and she really liked it. And she writes here, in fact, while working, I exhibit the most secure sense of self that I have ever have before in my life, meaning that she feels empowered. She feels like she's in the flow of her life. And, she, you know, she personally really likes doing this kind of work. Um, she said that lots of women are starting to do this during the virus because people are stuck at home and they're turning to other career options. But um, and she she. Th claims that a lot of people are turning to cam modeling because they think anyone can do it. But she says that it takes a particular kind of personality and, a, a, and particular skills. And from her estimation, some people are doing it for the wrong reasons because she, she was observing that some cam models do it because they hate men and or they seem to hate men or something. And she was saying that uh, she actually likes the people that she works with and she likes getting to know them and it and it feels good to get to know them. Uh, she goes on to say here, uh, quote, it, it requires a certain ability to put a man's needs above yours. I think we as sex workers are very nervous about admitting that we have that. Oh, she goes on to say here that um, she is afraid of admitting that she had a difficult childhood because she worries that everyone will assume, oh, there you are, difficult childhood, that's why you're a cam model, you have a pathology, and you have a pathological job. And uh, I'm here to tell you that cam models, lawyers, doctors, janitors, uh, stay-at-home parents, everyone has the chance of having a screwed up childhood <laughs> there uh, take it from me there are a lot of people walking around out there who 
when they really look at it, would characterize their childhood as having a lot of difficulties. So the fact that CAM models and sex workers also have difficult childhoods shouldn't surprise us because most, if not everyone, could be characterized as having a difficult childhood to some degree. Of course, there's varying degrees of of how you know difficult a childhood would be. But anyway, so CAM model from Seattle, she wanted to write in and say those things. And again, we all acknowledge that there is exploitation within the sex work industry. We all acknowledge and lament that some people are literally slaves who are brought from other countries or even just kidnapped within the United States and, and made forcibly to do sex work. We all acknowledge that there is exploitation and harm and abuses that happen to people, sometimes because it's not a regulated industry, because it's made to be on the fringes. If, if it were legalized and had, you could, and, and it is legalized in some areas, and there's a lot greater chance for the sex workers to have better circumstances because they don't have to hide in the shadows. I'm talking about sex workers who actually have physical contact with their clients. But uh, cam modeling obviously is, uh, I'm guessing, a lot safer. I'm guessing there's also people who stock cam models as well. But anyway, the the point is, is that uh, if we're going to move forward as a society, we need to stop stigmatizing it. We need to stop judging the sex workers. Um, we need to stop assuming that they're messed up and pathological. Um, you know, it, we need to grow up. Essentially, we are no. We, we shouldn't. Al, basically, as a society, we act like we're. 13 years old when it comes to sex work. It's all like tee hee hee and oh, it's gross. And you know, that's, that's for screwed up dirty people. The things that 13 year olds say, we need to grow up. We need, I don't want to denigrate 13 year olds, but I hope you get my point. As a society, we are adolescent and ignorant and simple minded when it comes to sex in general and sex work as well. We need to grow up. We need to just look at it. I don't know what the law should be. That's up to society and, and um, legislators to decide. But uh, I just feel like uh, people like Cam Model from Seattle who want to tell their story and maybe have a hard time telling their story at a party or with friends or with family. Uh, we just need to grow up and, and stop judging. So, all right, let's take a break. When we get back, let's go on to another email. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, please do so now. Go to patreon.com, become a patron. That's how we know you like what we are doing here. And also know they get access to all the best episodes, really. So become a patron by going to patreon.com. And if any of you have trouble with accessing premium episodes, email me because I'm here to help. Uh, usually it's just a small little glitch in the instructions that I need to, that I need to clear up. Also, know that a portion of your pledge goes towards various charities that we support, including scholarships. We've given thousands of dollars to students in mental health who are making a positive difference in the world. Go to our website to find the recipients of those uh, that money. And also, we've given money to animal uh, charities and homeless charities and LGBTQ charities. So, uh, so thank you, all you patrons out there who currently are patrons. Also, uh, I'm getting a lot of emails lately. So if you are not a patron, it's, it, I might have to not include your email on the list of emails that I'm going to respond to. So if, if you want me to respond to your emails, you have a better chance if you are a patron. Not always, but uh, it's, that's just a, a little tip there that is sometimes true. All right, let's go to an email. All right, this next email is from uh, an anonymous upper tier patron. She writes, I have a question about avoidant attachment. You mentioned in your deep dive on attachment theory that avoidant people tend to walk away from conflict. How does an avoidant person like me work on being okay with conflict? Largely, largely because I want to become a police officer, but policing is full of conflict and I have a hard time being around it. I also have a very hard time not feeling guilty or afraid about bothering people or potentially provoking conflict, like giving someone a ticket or knocking on a door when I'm not expected. 
I'm not sure if that's an avoidant thing or something I learned from my borderline mother who tended to try to who tended to try and escalate conflicts to get me to react and I shut down instead but I would appreciate any insight about how to deal with this. Okay, so let me just look at this. So in summary, she wants to become a, pl a police officer. She identifies as avoidant attachment style and she uh, avoid she she has a hard time with conflict and she's wondering how to navigate that. Uh, the, the short answer is, I, I don't know, because you would be an anonymous patron, have to work with someone in person. But generally speaking, I've worked with a lot of people, obviously with avoidant attachment, and also on how to be okay with conflict. And I also have a lot of people close to me who are police officers. Uh, but let's, let's look at this last thing here that you say, that um, you learned from your, you had a borderline mother, who was probably, I'm guessing, not attuned to your feelings all the time. And you say she tended to escalate conflicts to get me to react. And then I would shut down instead. And so maybe that's, so anonymous patron is saying, maybe that's why I avoid conflict. It's because my mom would start a lot of conflicts with me. And my way of coping with that is, was to avoid it completely. So, your, your question is, you know, does, does your uh, difficulty with conflict have anything to, to do with avoidant attachment or insecure attachment? And the answer is yes, absolutely. You just described it. Um, you grew up with someone who would try to start fights with you to, quote unquote, get you to react. And one of the, there's various different ways of coping with that in an ongoing manner. And one of them is just to shut down and become sort of like uninteresting to the other person so that they just stop bothering you. It's like playing dead, like a possum or something. And so when there's any kind of conflict coming your way, you probably shut down and become like a possum. That's kind of like avoiding attachment. We, I don't know if it's universal. I, I know it's not universal to avoid an attachment. There's certainly people out there with avoiding attachment who are okay with conflict. I would say it has more to do with your specific experience with your mother. Uh, so that there's that. But you're also asking, you know, how do I become okay with conflict? Well, there are five things that I would propose that anyone do if they want to become okay with conflict. The first thing is to address your automatic thoughts, your cognition. This is what cognitive therapy involves, which is what are the thoughts that you have, rational or irrational, regarding conflict? Like, Let's say that you have, uh, well, what well, during virus times, let's say you're at the grocery store and someone is just parked in the middle of the aisle and you don't want to get that close to them because you're worried about being infected. And so uh, it's, you, you might avoid conflict by turning around and going the other direction. But a part of you wants to say something and, and you, you want to avoid that conflict. Well, what are the thoughts that emerge in your mind as you contemplate confronting that person in the middle of the aisle? Thoughts like, this is going to go badly for me. I'm going to mess up the statement. They, they might want to hurt me. They might make a scene. I'll be embarrassed, whatever it is, whatever thoughts sort of pop into your mind. Well, some of those thoughts might be irrational, meaning that they're not, they're not likely to be true, meaning like one irrational thought might be like, um, they'll, they'll try to punch me in the face if I tell them to, to please move to, this, to the side. Uh, that's not probably likely. And you want to challenge that. You want to say, okay, that's a thought that pops in my head. I want to challenge that. Other thoughts uh, might we might deem as not being very helpful, even though they are rational. Like, oh, this woman might get upset with me. Okay, that's you know certainly possible. But is it helpful to focus on that? Is it is it is it fair that you have to turn around and walk the other direction? Is it is it fair that you just say something? Hey, could you please move to the side? I want to move around you because I'm worried about the virus. And if she goes ballistic, then, you know, that's on her. So there's certain thoughts that you have to sift through. And, and that's the beauty of cognitive therapy is that once you kind of sift through things, you'd be like, wait a second, I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions here that aren't necessarily true or aren't really helpful. And so 
I'm going to combat those in the moment by having opposing cognitions that say like, no, no, don't worry about that. So cognitions is, is one thing. So as, as you anonymous patron think about becoming a police officer and doing all the police officer conflict things, what are the thoughts that pop into your head? I mean, you want to evaluate the rationality and helpfulness of each of those thoughts and, and categorize them and, and sift and try to combat the ones that are not helpful and not rational. The second thing to do is exposure. This is behavioral therapy. This is where you become, your body becomes habituated to a process, to a stimulus. So in the same way that if you are terrified of snakes, and the way you cure yourself of the uh, anxiety about snakes is to very, very slowly habituate yourself to snakes. You don't jump into a pit of snakes. You look at a picture of a snake and, until your body habituates to the picture of the snake. And then you look at a video of a snake until your body habituates. This can take many, many uh, exposure sessions. You want to work with a therapist that knows how to do this sort of work because it's really kind of specific. Um, you can do it yourself, but it's probably much better if you work with a therapist, obviously. So with uh, conflict, you want to expose yourself to conflict. You want to uh, start small and work your way up and, and allow your body to get used to each intensity of conflict as you rise in, in the, the ladder. Um, you know, all police officers, ha ha I'm guessing, have a problem with conflict in the beginning because they, they've never had the sort of conflict that one has as a police officer. And so every police officer has to get used to that on some level. And so there's a ramping up uh, baby steps of getting, you know, more and more used to it. The second thing is preparation. This is similar to exposure, but it's more specific to policing, which is uh, training to be a police officer involves a lot of preparation. What do you do in this situation? What's the procedure? How do you react? What do you say? Who do you call? Uh, what, what's, what are the safety precautions that you do? Where's, do you have your equipment on you? All those kinds of things. There's, there's a procedure. And so by preparing for a conflict, and this should pre to any of you out there who worried about a conflict with a boss or a spouse, pr you know, prepare for it. Have, don't just walk in going, oh my God, I hope this goes well. Think through it. You know, think through, okay, if this happens, I'll do that. If this happens, I'll do that. Obviously, in police, uh, policing, there's a training process that is involved. Uh, the fourth thing is to get support. We are attachment creatures and need support. And so as you go through your anxious process of dealing with conflict, you need to have support. You need to have a good supervisor, good coworkers, good, good family members at home to vent to. Um, these are all important things. And then the fifth thing is healing. Whatever traumas resulted in you having, particularly with your mother, difficulties with, with confronting conflict, healing from those traumas will likely result in a reduced anxiety about conflict. So you really deserve that. Um, I'm guessing that you are in therapy, which is fantastic because a lot of you are out there and the way you're talking, I'm guessing that you are. Um, it's so... Those are the five things. Cognitions, which is cognitive therapy, exposure, which is behavioral therapy, preparation, support, and healing, which is interpersonal psychodynamic therapy. Okay, let's go on to the next email. All right, this next email is from patron Lara from Italy. She writes, it's Lara from Italy again. So just chiming in here. She wrote in early on during the coronavirus situation talking about how she was in a lockdown in Italy prior to the United States becoming a lockdown. It was interesting. Anyway, she says, uh, it's Lara from Italy again. Thank you so much for mentioning me in your first coronavirus podcast. In moments like this, even the smallest thought becomes a source of happiness. I'm now halfway through my second month of quarantine and something strange is happening. I'm having nightmares, really disturbing ones. I've been having a recurring nightmare since the beginning of the lockdown. I dream of getting out without wearing gloves and a face mask, finding myself in the midst of a, of a coughing crowd. However, this last week, things have gotten much heavier. Uh, she goes on to uh, give uh, some detail about some very strange and difficult nightmares that she was having. She goes on to say, 
Has this happened to you all, all of you listeners out there? Have you heard of any bizarre nightmares from your friends and family? End of email. Yeah, so I've been hearing a lot of reports of people talking about dreams in general and nightmares also as a subset of dreams. The thing that I'll say is that dreams are weird and we don't really understand why we have dreams or what the function is. We have some ideas and we can make some observations. Like if you don't dream at night, you actually have some diff- you have some problems in your memory and in your cognitive abilities later on. And there's conditions where you can even start hallucinating if you don't dream. For those of you who don't know, uh, we for the most part, dream every night. It's a normal part of the cycle of sleep that that we enter into a number of times throughout the night. So some people will say, I don't have dreams. And I'll say, if you didn't have dreams, then you're hallucinating right now because you would be having some really tough times if you didn't dream. It's a normal part of life. But we often don't remember our dreams. In fact, the it's, most people don't remember most of their dreams. So dreams are happening all the time uh, under normal circumstances. There's multiple dreams. So there's that. Like I said, we don't know why we dream. And any of those books out there that talk about um, dreams of flying means this and that. It's all stupid. It's all basically just one person's strange machinations about how dreams work. And it's, they're just trying to sell a book. Um, there, there's no way to generalize about dreams in that way. Like if you dream about a pencil, it means this. Everyone has a different association of what a pencil is or what flying is. And sometimes the brain just decides to make up weird stuff. So there's there's no way to know. Now, there seems to be some function with uh, storing things in long-term memory, making associations. Um, So, you know, there's some ideas there, but there's also some ideas that it's trying to work something out, uh, some problem we're trying to solve. It, there's also some ideas that it reflects certain emotional experiences that we're having during the day. Those all seem, you know, credible to me, but it's all in this a big mismatch of experiences that people have. Dreams, you, you can talk about a dream and you'll be like, man, that was just such an interesting situation. Now, I will tell you that I have worked with clients and other people on dream analysis collaboratively with them and found that it can be a very fruitful endeavor. Uh, but I do it collaborative, collaboratively with people. I will tend to ask them for their dream. I ask a lot of questions. I ask them, okay, you dreamt about a haunted house. What's your associate? Like with Laura, she says that she had a dream about getting out without wearing gloves and a face mask and finding herself in the midst of a coughing crowd. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what that dream is about, but I might ask more specifically, like, how'd you feel? What were some of the things around you? What were some of the associations? And then I might ask, what, what do you think that means to you? What do you think the deeper meaning of that, of that dream is to you? So it's a lot, of, a lot of eliciting from the client their associations, their analysis of their dream. And I find that when I give people a chance to really explore that, a lot of really interesting things can happen. And sometimes I'll throw in little questions like, well, you realize like like with Lara, if she were to talk about this dream, she might describe, okay, she's in a crowd, she's on the street, she doesn't have any gloves, she doesn't have a face mask, and there's all these people, and she saw this one old lady coughing right in her face. Well, what I will sometimes point out is that the old lady in the dream was created by Lara herself. Lara created that old person. Lara created all those people. So uh, we often identify with one part of the dream, the protagonist of the dream, and we will uh, tend to refer to these other elements of the dream as being outside of ourselves, but of course the dream is completely made up by us. And so we are all the elements of the dream. In the same way that I am in my head, I'm also in my toes. In the same way that I am in the protagonist of the dream, I am also in the coughing woman. The coughing woman is me and I am the protagonist. Why did I create a coughing woman? What part of me is a coughing woman? So those are sometimes interesting roads to go down. Not always, but anyway. So it is true that when people are anxious, there seems to be an increase in anxious dreams. But this is hard to measure, and it's what do you call an anxious dream versus a regular dream. But 
anecdotally, at the very least, a lot of people will attest to when they're going through an anxious uh, day or week or month, their dreams after that point will uh, reflect those, those feelings. Uh, same with sexuality or with having fun or with various different themes of your day emotionally will often be reflected in one's dreams. Also, during these troubling times, a lot of people are having trouble sleeping. And when you have trouble sleeping and you wake up throughout the night or you wake up earlier than you sh normally do, you will tend to remember your dreams more often because when we wake up in the middle of a dream, we tend to remember the dream. If we don't wake up in the middle of a dream, we tend not to remember the dream. That's why we tend to remember the dreams that we have, uh, you know, as we're waking up as opposed to the dreams we had just after we fell asleep. So uh, that's another thing that's happening right now, I think, is that people are having trouble sleeping because of various issues that are going on in their life, a lot of disruption, a lot of worries. And so not only are they having more anxious dreams, but they're also having, they're also remembering their dreams more. Another thing it, that I think is happening is that we're living through an unprecedented time. It's a very, this is, I, you know, I, I don't think in the entire history of the world have we had a, a moment like this. There's been other pandemics, but not during the age of the internet and of CNN and Fox News and, you know, these kinds of things. This is a very, very strange time. And during this time, like after 9-11, for example, which was another very strange time for Americans, that we tend to take note of our dreams more. I've found that to be true, that when things are just kind of normal, people have dreams and they don't necessarily share them. But during this time, I feel like there's a lot of uh, hyper-focus, which is fine, on a lot of things in our life, including our dreams. And so you, you mix all that up together, anxiety equals anxiety dreams, trouble sleeping, equals remembering your dreams and weird times means take note of your dreams and share your dreams. And so there's just going to be a lot of talk about our dreams. I will tell you as someone who does this kind of work, dream analysis on a regular basis, whether there's a pandemic or not, that anxiety dreams are happening all the time and weird dreams are happening all the time. Uh, are they happening more now? I, I don't suspect that they are. I suspect people are having more anxiety dreams, but the fact that people are having anxiety dreams and weird dreams right now, I, I don't, f in my world, find particularly strange because I've been paying attention to this for a long time. But who knows? It Maybe research will come out in the future. There's going to be a lot of research. A lot of psychology people, sociologists, are uh, licking their chops, try, you know, thinking about their dissertation, thinking about getting funding to do research on the grand experiment that we played on ourselves during the lockdown and during the news coverage of the coronavirus and of people dying from, from the virus. So uh, over the next five, 10 years, we're going to see a treasure trove of data gathering and analysis and findings that will tell us more about the human condition. Not obviously from the psychology standpoint, but that I'm saying right now, but obviously more importantly from the uh, pandemic, uh, epidemiology, uh, world health, uh, public health uh, situation as well. We'll have a lot of research on that. But in the psychology realm, at, like after 9-11, there was a lot of research that went into looking at how 9-11 affected groups of people. And um, so we'll be looking forward to those studies and maybe one will come out about dreams. I'm guessing that there will be. Thanks for that email. Patron Laura from Italy, I hope you're doing well. All right, this next email is an interesting one. It's from upper tier patron Edward from San Francisco. He writes, I wonder if you could discuss ways in which an avoidant and a preoccupied person might learn to communicate with one another while avoiding the tendency to polarize because of their different attachment styles. So just chiming in here, if you're new to the podcast, there's these two things called preoccupied attachment and avoidant attachment. Preoccupied attachment is when we're raised in a way in which we have to lean into relationships to have any kind of love and closeness in our life. We have to chase people, essentially. Avoidant attachment is due to lack of attunement and bad parenting. We have to, we learn that it's better to avoid attachments. 
on the surface, even though deep down we're desperately wanting attachment, but we avoid it and we sort of turn ourselves away from other people. So getting back to patron Edwards' email from San Francisco, I wonder if you could discuss ways in which an avoidant and a preoccupied person might learn to communicate with one another while avoiding the tendency to polarize because of their different relationship styles. In some ways, my partner and I are very similar. We share common beliefs and have lived deeply meaningful, li- meaning, deeply meaningful experiences together. We both feel and love deeply. We appreciate our deep connection, and our loving relationship is based on a friendship of years. And yet I find myself often preoccupied with our relationship. For me, as a mainly preoccupied person, she is for me the most important reality in my life. And while I know that she loves me, I still worry that I won't be worthy of that love or that I won't give her enough love. I feel the need to always tell her how, how much I love her. So just chiming in here, if you are not aware of what preoccupied attachment is, and this sounds foreign to you, listen to these words, because this is very common for people with preoccupied attachment. If you suffer from preoccupied attachment, or you have someone in your life who has preoccupied attachment, this description will sound very familiar to you. So I'm going to go back. So he says, you know, I have a great, we have a great relationship. Um, but I find myself very preoccupied with her regardless of the fact that I know we have a very good relationship. For me, as a mainly preoccupied person, she is, for me, the most important reality in my life. And while I know that she loves me, I still worry that I won't be worthy of that love or that I won't give her enough love. I feel the need to always tell her how much I love her. I long to serve her in small ways and always want to let her know how much I care and how available I want to be for her. Specifically, I tend to find reassurance in in talking about our relationship. And this is something that she finds particularly trying as she feels that it's just talking for the sake of talking. When this happens, I tend to feel looked down upon and weak as weak and inferior. When I then try to talk, approach, and soothe, with her style, she tends to respond by going offline, as she says, due to her avoidant attachment style. This, of course, triggers my fears and ramps up my anxiety concern that I must do something and just can't be at peace until I do something. She has also told me that my effusiveness about how much I love her can make her feel bad as if she loves me less or was somehow insufficient, which understandably she finds frustrating and hurtful. And around and around we go. Nevertheless, we have always faced challenges together and have been through difficult moments. I'm sure this is a textbook case, really. Both of us listen to your podcast, and we have listened to your deep dive into attachment styles. She very much wants me to grow in security and not subject my own needs and desires to serving her all the time. Could you discuss ways in which people whose prevalent styles are avoidant and preoccupied can grow together? Are there specific steps that they can take to try to help one another become more secure and independent while still growing in their love? End of email. So the first thing is, is I will commend you, uh, Edward from San Francisco and your partner, that you have massive self-awareness. You and your partner uh, are some of the most self-aware people I have ever heard about. So great job. That goes a long way. I don't know where you got that intelligence and uh, vulnerability from, but I commend you. Kudos to you for that. It's fantastic. Uh, The... Next thing I'll say is, yes, it is a textbook case. <laughs> you, you, you have a textbook case, not, not to diminish or demean that you and your partner, but yes, you have a classic preoccupied avoidant relationship there in the preoccupied position, as you're describing quite well. The assumption is that a lack of noticeable connection equals a lack of connection. I want to repeat that. For the preoccupied person, the person who had to chase their parents' love to get any love, the assumption that they felt was that in the, if there is no evidence of a connection, then that must mean there is no connection, which means that I'm not going to get any love and attention. 
So you're three, four years old, and your parents often are not attuned to you. They might even be abusing you or who knows, but just lack of attunement, lack of good parenting. But every once in a while, you get this nugget of good parenting. And so the child learns, I have to be very vigilant to pay attention to when those nuggets are coming. And I have to engineer my relationship with them so that I get more nuggets because sometimes I do. So I have to be, I have to be on the lookout all the time. I have to make my attachment needs met or I have to make my attachment needs known. I have to scream and cry and tell everyone around me how I feel because otherwise I'm just going to be left in the dust. And during those times when there was a lack of noticeable connection, there was a lot of anxiety because it's like, well, if my parents aren't, if I don't feel connected to my parents right now or those who I see as my caregivers, then that is going to result in me being left in the dust, which, which often happens. And so the adult grows up and they they retain that assumption. Like when there's lack of a noticeable connection, when there's lack of strong evidence of a connection, then that equals a lack of connection and love. So to be specific to the preoccupied, to, to the secure person who has secure attachment style, of which I'm growing more and more suspicious doesn't really exist in any adult in, in its entirety. Everyone has at least a few toes in one of the insecure attachment styles. But the uh, for the secure person, when they are in a relationship, uh, well, let's just use myself. Why not? We're at the end of the episode. <laughs> uh, me and my wife, I will attest to having mostly secure uh, attachment style, the two of us. Our parents raised us pretty well. And we've worked hard to have a very secure relationship. And so uh, there are a lot of moments in our day-to-day life where we're quarantining, we're at home all the time now. (laughs) We see each other all the time. And yet sometimes she's in her office, I'm in my office, and we might not really be connecting. We might go for hours or days without really a significant kind of um, warm moment, shall we say. And during those times, uh, for both of us, there's there could be a question mark as to, well, I haven't seen any direct evidence that the person, you know, for me, I'll just speak from my standpoint, uh, I might have a moment where I might say to myself, well, there's no real direct evidence that she loves me uh, over the past few days. Has she fallen out of love with me? I don't know. Uh, there's, she hasn't told me that she loved me or she hasn't really shown me that she really loves me. I'm wondering if she loves me. Okay. So to the preoccupied person, because of their relational, relational traumas, that question mark is very scary to the preoccupied person because when they were growing up, that question mark usually meant very bad things. To a secure person who was raised well enough, and I would claim to be one of those people, when I have that question mark, I assume that, well, it, I'm sure she still loves me. <laughs> in, in the absence of evidence that she doesn't love me, there's no evidence that she doesn't love me. You know what I mean? She, she hasn't asked for a divorce or anything like that. She hasn't yelled at me or given me any bad faces or anything. Um, I haven't seen any other men, uh, you know, calling around. <laughs> and so, uh, so there's no evidence that she loves me or she doesn't love me, but I have enough security in my heart because the world taught me at the age of two, three, and four, that when people say they love me, I can bank on that as being true, even in the in-between times when I don't have evidence of love. And so when there's lack of evidence of love from my wife, I just have this assumption that she does love me. And I, and I don't get scared. To the preoccupied person, they get scared. Now, for, the, for you preoccupied people out there, or for you people who are with preoccupied people out there, there's no way to get rid of that anxiety. There, there's a little bit, you can, you can mitigate it a little bit by knowing you're preoccupied and, and trying to reassure yourself. But that preoccupied, that, that anxiety is in your bones. It's in your neurons. There is no way to get around that. And uh, so just know that Uh, attachment style is a neuronal reality. It is a, uh, a, a fixed part of one's personality that can change because the brain is plastic, but it takes time. So my point here is that it's, it's for uh, patron Edward, 
he knows that he's preoccupied and yet he still suffers from it. And I, th I think that's, that's incredibly important to point out. So for the avoidant person, which you're Edward saying that your wife is, your girlfriend, your partner is, that for her, uh, the assumption is uh, that I don't really have feelings. I, I, don't, I don't think I have feelings like the way other people do. And they'll also say, you know, if I do have feelings though, you know, why bother other people? That's the assumption. Other people don't care about my feelings. Now to the avoidant person, when you're talking to them, they won't necessarily know any of these things because the preoccupied person knows what's happening. They feel the feelings. They know they are anxious. To the avoidant person, they're so avoidant often that they don't even know they're avoiding. Yet they're avoiding the avoiding. <laughs> they're in denial of the denial. And so to the avoidant person, it's much harder for them to become self-aware. To the preoccupied person, it's very easy. When I just, when I, I, I teach uh, students at my university and I will walk uh, students through an exercise of them figuring out their own attachment style. And without a doubt, when, within five minutes of describing uh, attachment styles, those who are preoccupied in the in, in, in among the students will say, they'll raise their hand and be like, oh my God, I'm preoccupied. <laughs> they know right away. They're like, oh my God, you're describing me. I, ca I can't believe how accurately you're describing me right now. This is weird. So it's called preoccupied attachment. Weird. Okay, I'm going to look that up. To the avoidant people, it might take weeks for them to come to grips with it. I will talk about attachment style for weeks, you know, one class, you know, I'll talk about it for an hour and a half and then a couple of weeks later, I'll talk about it for another hour. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll talk about it for another hour. And then I have them reflect on in their papers and they explore their own attachment style. The avoided person at the beginning of the quarter, uh, when I'm teaching, big, beginning of the class, beginning of the term, they'll they'll often say, oh, I think I'm secure. And I'll say, okay. And because some people are, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people who, are, who do have secure attachment primarily. But of the secure people at the beginning of the term, a good number of them, if not most of them, by the end of the quarter will say, actually, I think I'm avoided. So that's a, that's, a, that's a tougher position to be in in a lot of ways. Um, well, there's pros and cons. The, the, the con to avoidance is that you're not aware of your avoidance. The pro to avoidance is that you tend to be a lot more emotionally stable and your life tends to be a lot more stable because you've basically at a young age just given up on other human beings. And so you just, you're less pulled by the dramas of other people, whereas preoccupied people are very much affected by other people. And so there's a lot of push pull and ups and downs for preoccupied people anyway. So textbook case, the preoccupied person, Edward, yourself, you are pursuing her and she is distancing. Uh, it's just a classic preoccupied avoidant match. Now, some people will say, is this a good match or, a, or is it a bad match? There, there's no research that says either way. Uh, re and research has looked into this. Preoccupied people can be in wonderful relationships with avoidant people. And preoccupied people and avoidant people can be very bad matches. It's not that simple is the point. We hear in Edward's uh, uh, email how aware he is. And so even though he has a pretty healthy case of preoccupation, he, he's aware of it. He's taking care of himself. He, he, he is taking care of his, his spouse. And so it, it's all about awareness and, and what you do with the feelings. So you ask your patron, Edward, could you discuss ways in which people whose prevalent styles are avoidant and preoccupied can grow together? So you're saying essentially, can, can me and my spouse, can we grow together even though we are so preoccupied and avoidant? And what I'll say to this is you're doing it, man. You're self-aware. That's a huge thing right there. Most people aren't. Most people don't even know what attachment styles are to begin with. It's something that I think should be taught throughout grade school and high school, but it's not. But you're self-aware and you get it. So you're doing it. You're wondering, you know, how can we grow together? Well, you're doing it. You're self-aware. Uh, you've gotten to know your spouse's attachment style very well, that, that, 
that very much helps. And you're thinking of, you're trying to change your cognitions. I'm sure there are many times when you're thinking, oh my God, I don't think she loves me. And then you're like, well, wait a second. I think that's just my preoccupied attachment talking and you reel it in. And so you're doing that. You're vulnerable. She's vulnerable and you're giving each other grace. So you're, you're doing it. Uh, you have another question here. Are there specific steps that can, uh, that you can take to try and help one another become more secure and independent while still growing in their love. So this is interesting. So in between the lines of your question here, Edward, is you're saying, how do I become more secure and independent while also growing in my love for my spouse? Those seem to be uh, those seem to be contradictory, right? You're like, if I'm going to become independent, does that mean I become uh, less dependent on my spouse and more distant from my spouse? Because I, I don't want that. I want to stay close to my spouse. Well, those things can happen at the same time. In fact, they do happen at the same time. As you become more attachment secure, which means more independent, but, though, but let me address the word independent for a second. A lot of times people will look at you Edward and Edward and people like Edward will look at themselves as saying, I'm too dependent. I need to be more independent. And although on some level that's kind of true, it's not a, a very useful goal to chase, in my opinion. It's a judgmental goal, usually, not always. And I can't tell with you, but a lot of times with people who are preoccupied, I very quickly say, no, 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 we, we're, not, we're not moving towards independence. We're not moving towards individuation. What we're moving towards is security, which you say, you know, we're moving toward is secure attachments. We're moving towards relationships in which you are dependent on other people and other people are dependent on you, which is normal and human, but you're more secure. You're more secure in their love. You believe that they love you in a more profound way so that you don't worry about them not loving you because that's the preoccupied person and the avoidant person, both preoccupied and avoidant people are worried that people don't really love them, even though they might say they love them all the time. Now, the avoidant person just avoids. It's like, ah, screw it. I don't need other people. The preoccupied person chases and they try to do, you know, what you're doing. So, so anyway, that's just some, uh, the word independent kind of triggered me. So, but you're asking, you know, how, how do I, are there steps that we, you know, you can take to be more secure and again, you're doing it. You're, it sounds like your relationship with your uh, spouse is very secure. Uh, you know, you describe the beginning here. Let's see. Um, we share common beliefs. We, ha we have happily li have lived deeply meaningful experiences together. We both feel and love deeply. We appreciate our deep connection. So, it sounds to me like a very secure relationship. And through that security, you are healing. You're growing in your love over time and you're becoming more secure in all likelihood. I can't tell for sure, but that's just my guess. Other things you can, so you're doing it. You're just keep going. It sounds like you're on a good path. The other thing obviously is go to couples therapy with someone who understands attachment styles and someone who understands attachment um, in general. Emotionally focused therapists often know, but they don't always. And attachment oriented therapy therapists usually know they don't always, but those are some key words I might look into. Also keep getting to know your attachment styles, keep furthering your self-awareness and keep talking with each other. It sounds like you're doing a lot of that. You're explaining to each other, you know, here's how I experience my attachment style. Here's how I experience your attachment style. Some tips though, Edward. When you have an urge to say, I love you to your spouse, it sounds like that is an interesting moment. You, you, you're telling me that when uh, you, you frequently throughout the day feel this urge and will enact on, an, on the urge to say, I love you, or to want to talk about the relationship and to um, verbally connect with your, with your spouse. And what I would uh, guess would be helpful speculation is when those urges happen for you is to reflect on why they are happening. Don't just act on it right away. Take a beat and think about, Oh, I have an urge to say, I love you. And, and really, I, I really want to, I really want to grab her and just say, Oh my God, I love you so much. 
ref- reflect on it for a second. There's nothing wrong with expressing love. There's nothing wrong with having a upwelling of love and affection for someone and expressing that. That's great. But there's a possibility that what is happening in that moment is that you're having an attachment threat. You're feeling an attachment threat of some kind, however rational or irrational. There's, a, there's something that's happening inside of you deep down where you feel threatened in some way. Either she's been quiet for a little bit or she got a text from someone or uh, a hot guy walked by and you're like, oh my God, does she like him? Or uh, who knows? Who knows what triggers you? But something, something triggered you, a look, a, a look that she had on her face, just something. And that threat uh, scared you. And th- your normal coping style with that is preoccupation. That's preoccupi- preoccupation and avoidance are coping styles with attachment insecurity. They're not weird ways of acting. They're, they're very helpful ways of coping with what happened when we were young that we retain into our adulthood that we don't need anymore as, as adults, but we retain it. So you feel that attachment threat. And as a way of coping with that, you very quickly jump to this behavior of, well, if, if I shower her with love, then I will get her to sometimes reciprocate with a little bit of love. And then I I won't have this fear inside of me anymore. So when those moments happen and you think, I have an urge to say, I love you. Well, let me reflect on that for a second. Actually, I think this moment is not really an upwelling of love, but a upwelling of anxiety. And so can I self soothe in this moment? Can I say to myself, Oh, just because X, Y, and Z happens, that doesn't mean that she doesn't love me. I need to remind myself everything's okay. Every, you know, calm down. Everything's okay. Or just tell her, just be like, so I just want to let you know that I, I had an urge to say I love you and shower you with love. But really what I think was happening for me was that I was getting anxious. Be, I, I felt like this attachment threat because of this happened. And I know that that's not your fault, but you know, I have this preoccupied attachment, insecure attachment thing. And, and that's what happened for me. And I was about to shower you with a bunch of love statements, but I realized that that wasn't really genuine. It wasn't, that wasn't really my intent um, because that might be what kind of bothers your spouse is that when you shower her with I love yous, there are times when you're genuine and she likes it. And there are times when it feels like a anxious manipulation, a way of trying to force or fish some sort of reassurance from her. And that can feel really bad to people. When people feel like they're being manipulated, even if it's being showered with I love yous and I think you're great, but if there's an agenda behind those statements, it can feel really hurtful uh, to, to be uh, manipulated in that way. Whereas it's, it's so much more congruent and less crazy making. If you're just, if you just say, I almost wanted to say, I love you, or let's say you just start showering her with love and you're like, wait a second, why am I doing this right now? Hey, I'm going to stop here and say, I was just showering you with love because actually I'm really scared right now because of something that happened earlier. And I was sharing you with, with love statements because I was hoping that you would tell me that you really love me and that you would reassure me that you love me. To the avoided person, they will almost universally appreciate that. If your girlfriend or, I can't, is it a girlfriend you were talking about earlier? <laughs> um, let's see, uh, a partner, he's just a partner, okay. So your partner, if she's listening right now, she's probably like, I'm just taking a guess. She's probably like, oh my God, yes. Uh, I've had so many conversations with preoccupied and avoidant people that, you know, I can predict that. I don't know. That's probably just patting myself in the back. Who knows? I could be completely off base. But anyway, the point is, is that the, uh, to notice your anxiety and express that is much less problematic to your partner than for you to do things subversively to, uh, uh, account for the anxiety that you're feeling. Um, Another thing that you can do in the moment is say, can you please just reassure me that you love me? It's one of those moments. So a a wonderful routine that you and your partner can have. And this is true for all you people out there, by the way, even for avoidant people, which it's anyone is when you notice 
when you become self-aware and you notice that there are times when you feel lonely, you feel disconnected from your spouse, uh, have a routine of ways that you actually ask for your spouse to bridge the gap. You know, you're bidding for attachment security. So if that is hugging someone or saying, I need a 30 minute hug or 30 second hug, or asking someone, hey, could you just reassure me that you love me right now because I'm having kind of a low moment right now. There's a million different ways, but those are some of the ways that I've seen people do it. You need to notice when you f have those worries of disconnection and have a functional way of asking the other person. And the other person has to respond well, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Uh, but they usually do because they usually, if they're given a chance without being accused and without any complications, they usually will respond well because they have a heart and they do love you. So that is that. And that is that for that email. And that is that for that episode. Everyone out there, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, particularly you patrons, because you're patrons and <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't patrons, I get it. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with you as well. <laughs> You're all great people to me, um, really, uh, from the bottom of my heart, honestly. That is that is true. I, I communicate with a lot of listeners, and it just makes my day to uh, connect with people. That's why I do this thing. And take care of yourself. Take care of others because you deserve it. You really, really do. Mm -hmm.